This is the WOW Signal Podcast, a podcast produced by the Dream of the Open Channel. Welcome. It's November 2014, and this is your host, Paul Carr. About two years ago, I named this podcast after an important event that took place in August of 1977. But here we are, well into the second season of the WOW Signal, have not yet devoted more than a few passing references to that event and nothing close to a full episode. Well, this is that episode. My aim is that anyone listening comes away well-informed, not just about what the wow signal was, but why it was important and what we should be doing to follow up on it. First, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the remarkable radio telescope in rural Ohio, since dismantled, that detected the wow signal. Then what the wow signal actually was, why it was a real candidate for an extraterrestrial beacon, Not only that, but there is a story here of people with the vision, invention, and energy to bring a scientific enterprise to fruition with a maximum of ingenuity and industry and a minimum of money. Humans like John Krause, Robert Dixon, Jerry Emmon, and Robert Gray. There are probably others who deserve recognition, and if you know them, let me know so who they are so I can correct that oversight. We are very fortunate to have as a guest on this episode one of the key players in the detection of the wow signal, Robert S. Bob Dixon, to tell us about his role in bringing the big ear to bear on SETI and where SETI has gone since then. One of the best sources on the wow signal is the book by Robert Gray. The Elusive Wow. I tried to contact Mr. Gray to appear in the episode, but I was unable to track him down. Robert Gray, if you are listening, I would love to do an interview. Please email me at wowsignalpodcast at gmail.com. Gray's book not only goes into great detail about the wow signal, but also about his own efforts to find it again at other radio observatories. There are some other good resources on the WOW signal that I can recommend, including a fine article, just a little bit technical, by Jerry Emmon, the discoverer of the signal at the Big Ear. I will have links in the show notes at wowsignalpodcast.com. The Big Ear Observatory was designed by Ohio State University astronomy professor John D. Kraus. After several years of intense labor, it was completed in 1963. Unlike many radio telescopes, the Big Ear was not a parabolic dish mounted on two big, precise gimbals, but rather was fixed on the ground. And I'll have a picture of it in the show notes if you want to see what it looked like. The rotation of the Earth scanned the telescope in one direction, right ascension if you're familiar with astronomical jargon, and its pointing in the other direction, declination, was accomplished by adjusting the angle of a giant flat wire mesh reflector. 340 feet long by 100 feet high. The land it was constructed on was owned by Ohio Wesleyan University and was located near Delaware, Ohio. The purpose of the Big Ear was to conduct a sensitive survey of deep space radio sources, compiling a catalog of these sources that other radio astronomers would be able to follow up on with more detailed studies. The Big Ear accomplished this goal with the Ohio Sky Survey, conducted between 1965 and 1971. This survey identified almost 20,000 radio sources, the majority of which had not been previously identified. After the Ohio Sky Survey was complete, the question arose of what more could be done with the instrument. Bigger and better radio telescopes were coming online, and there was no point in repeating the Ohio Sky Survey. 
Bob Dixon, who we'll meet in just a moment, proposed that the Big Ear conduct a full-time SETI search, something no one had done before. Day and night, the Big Ear would scan the heavens as the Earth turned while its sensitive receiver scanned radio wavelengths near 21 centimeters. The wavelength were a commonly detected natural emission line, a hyperfine transition of neutral hydrogen, is found. The search began in 1973. The reasoning behind the search is that no matter how an ET civilization came upon radio astronomy, they would have to be aware of the important 21-centimeter wavelength. And if they wished to announce their presence to other civilizations, they would recognize this fact and possibly choose this frequency for a beacon. We humans first predicted and observed the existence of the neutral hydrogen 21-centimeter line in the early days of radio astronomy, in the 1940s and early 1950s. Note that the frequency corresponding to the 21-centimeter wavelength is 1420.40575 megahertz. Some of you might remember that in Episode 5 of Season 1, I asked you to play E.T. Systems Engineer in designing a Bracewell probe. Now, let's play E.T. SETI Researcher. The purpose of a beacon is to announce your presence. The simplest form of a beacon, and you would want it to be simple, is an unmodulated carrier that has only one very narrow wavelength. Natural sources are spread over a range of wavelengths, so it is a reasonable hypothesis that we might find an ET beacon at 21 centimeters in a narrow band. There are a couple of complications here we need to mention. The first is that ET's radio transmitter and the big ear receiver are certainly moving with respect to each other, so that a well-known bit of physics called the Doppler effect will result in the radio frequency being shifted from the exact 1420.40575 1420.40575 megahertz. Since we don't know if the transmitter is moving away or toward the big ear, the frequency could be shifted up or down away from the 21 centimeter emission line. The second complication is really twofold. To get enough power behind the signal to overwhelm the background noise, our industrious but likely underfunded alien engineer is going to have to concentrate signal energy over a narrow part of the sky. Also, E.T. almost certainly doesn't know humans are capable of receiving microwave transmissions. We simply haven't been radiating them long enough, especially in 1977, but even now. Therefore, E.T. SETI researchers would have to radiate to thousands or even millions of candidate worlds, and no one world would have the beacon aimed at it for very long, unless they have a much bigger budget than we think. If you do receive a beacon signal, it won't be for long, and it may not come back for a very long time. With those preliminaries understood, let's talk to a leading expert on the big ear. Dr. Robert S. Bob Dixon, in his very first podcast interview. Robert Dixon attended the University of Wisconsin at Madison, where he received bachelor and master's degrees in electrical engineering. He received his Ph.D. in electrical engineering from Ohio State in 1968, where he became involved with the Ohio State Radio Observatory. As we will hear, he was heavily engaged in the SETI investigations at Ohio State that resulted in the WOW signal detection. Dr. Dixon spent most of his career at Ohio State University and published a number of papers and book chapters, many of them on radio astronomy and SETI. We did have a technical glitch in this interview when Skype dropped our call for a moment. I edited out the glitchy bits, but some of what you hear may seem like a repeat because I asked Bob to start over. Is that, is that you, Bob? Yes, me, Paul. How are oh, you? Good, good. Uh, thanks for uh, spending some time with me. I've been trying to get a hold of somebody involved with the Big Ear for over a year. Uh, really? Yeah. Um, unfortunately, as you know, it's, you guys are pretty scattered now. So, but um, yeah, you know, we have a website that's got a lot of stuff on it. Yeah. 
I, I found that very helpful to uh, getting this interview together. Um, the I'd like to start out uh, by asking you about the early history of your involvement in Ohio State at, with the uh, with the Big Ear, which was constructed shortly before you arrived there, I believe. Uh, the you uh, you went for when you went to Ohio State for your PhD. Did you expect to get involved with radio astronomy? Absolutely. In fact, that's the reason I went there. You know, I was originally at Wisconsin, and I wanted to work in radio astronomy. And John Krause was a pioneer in radio astronomy. So we had a lot of commonality. So I applied for a graduate student assistantship there, and he hired me. And as you said, the telescope went on the air some shortly before I got there. So they were still running pen and ink strip charts. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was given the task of computerizing the system so that we could have computer processing and recording and displaying of data. So I did that, and that ended up being my Ph.D. project. Now, the, uh, you received your Ph.D. in 1968. Right. Uh, when Big Air was still doing its primary science mission. Uh, yes. The uh, were you already interested in SETI at that point? Well, I, I guess I had always been, but I didn't necessarily know any way that I could get involved. And then gradually, you know, people started doing radio SETI, and I thought that was really interesting. And then I realized that we had a very good radio telescope that was available. They could do this because our first mission of scientifically surveying the entire sky for natural radio sources was coming to an end. So I was able to convince the director, John Krause, that, well, why don't we just start up a SETI program? Because we had the equipment and we had the telescope and it didn't cost hardly anything. So we began the uh, really the world's first full-time study program using a large radio telescope. Now, I noticed that uh, in your CV, you, stay, you were involved with uh, Project Cyclops in 1971, which you designed on paper a, uh, a very large uh, SETI observatory. So did, now, that never came to fruition, but did that inspire your work with Big Air to some extent? <laughs> Well, we had already started doing some of that stuff at Big Ear, but yes, then I became aware of Project Cyclops, and I thought, well, this sounds wonderful. So I applied and was selected as one of the scientists to participate in that. And we did design that large radio telescope. It was not really intended as something that was going to be built soon, but as something that showed the way and developed a lot of new technology and I think uh, really got the attention of the world and, and what it was possible and practical to do. Okay. Uh, so the, uh, in 1973, you, you were granted a, some money to do the uh, SETI project, and that ran for a number of years. I noticed in your – there's a paper, on my, and I'll have a link to it in the show notes for any listeners that want to read this paper for themselves – it's called um, the uh, the Ohio SETI program in the first decade that was published in 1984. In that, you note that there that in addition to the Wow signal, there was a number of other single point detections. Yes, you know we statistically you always detect things, and the stronger they are, the fewer they are. We had a number of uh, single point detections. But the WOW object was the most perfect and the strongest and the most famous because it met all the criteria for exactly what we were looking for. Very strong, very narrow band signal, clearly of intelligent origin. And so that's why we got excited about it, and that's why a lot of other people have gotten excited about it. Yes, and it's still uh, being mentioned today in the press. So uh, Now, there are... But but uh, it was a strong. Were there other signals uh, detected during that project that 
were the same signatures as the WoW, but just not as strong? Yes, there were. There were a number. Uh, nothing that we got as excited about, because statistically you're always going to have a few false alarms. But that one was so strong and so significant, you know, it just cannot be a fluke. And you're, you're, you're satisfied that it's been, th that all the possibilities for the, the wow signal being a false alarm have been ruled out? Yes, I am. <clears throat> it was not a hoax. I mean, that would have required an inside job by somebody on our staff to write some sneaky computer program to make it appear. And that didn't happen. Uh, there was no terrestrial radio signal of any kind. Uh, it was no known Earth satellite. Could conceivably have been some super secret military satellite doing things they shouldn't have been done because nobody's allowed to be transmitting in that frequency range. Right. But, uh, you know, the, th the thing is, at a one time event, you never know. You know, and we've looked and other people have looked in that same location, I never found anything again, so we will never know what that really was. Hmm. Now, uh, you, you are, are you still involved with the uh, Ohio Radio Observatory? Yes. Uh, some years ago, the Big Air Telescope was uh, torn down because the university uh, got out of the uh, land program and the pro property where it was on was sold to a housing development. <laughs> mm -hmm. So the whole thing was torn down for scrap, and now there are houses and lakes and roads where the telescope was. But at about that same time, we became very interested in a new kind of telescope, which is called Argus. And that's named after the methodological being that had 100 eyes and could look in all directions at the same time. Because our experience with these one-time signals was such that well, they could be occurring all the time in directions where we're not looking, and we would never see them. So we wanted to create a telescope that could, in fact, look in all directions all the time. And that required all new technology. But simultaneously with that was the development of modern computing, which made highly computing intensive projects possible. So we started building this small Argus radio telescope, which uh, we built and has been slowly improved and, in fact, is operating now. In fact, the live data from the radio telescope is on the web, and anybody can look at it now. Oh, we'll have to definitely put a link to that. Uh, now, Argus, you say omnidirectional. It looks basically at the entire sky that's visible at that point. That's right. There's no scanning. It looks at but the entire sky all the time. And this, where is this? Is this located uh, in Ohio as well? Yes, it's located on the campus of the Ohio State University. Okay. How, it's how located can, on, the, on the roof? Can you give us the, some idea of, of how big it is? What it looks like? Uh, or is there? I'll, I'll, I'll find a picture somewhere. I'm sure, but sure, <clears throat> it's an array of uh, around 32 small antenna elements, each of which is a spiral array about oh, maybe this big in diameter, sitting flat on the roof of the building. And there are 32 of them scattered around in all directions on the roof of that building. And uh, nothing moves. It just sits there. And as each of those has an amplifier connected to it, and there are cables that run downstairs into the room where we have all the computing equipment. And at that point, the data from all those 32 elements is combined by the computer and forming beams that look in all directions in the sky all the time. Now, could that how could that uh, prototype that you have now could that have detected the wow signal? No, it's too small. It's a uh, you know just only a prototype at this point. We would need a telescope of about the same size as Big Ear, which is you know, much larger, the equivalent of, say, a 150-foot diameter dish or so. This mm -hmm. one is equivalent to about a 25-foot dish. So, okay. So uh, you'd like to build a much larger uh, array, of course. Fun funding, now, is this, is this intent primarily intended for SETI? Does it have other scientific purposes as well? Well, it has 
it can detect any transient signals or anything that flies. So it can detect aircraft. It could detect thunderstorms. Uh, anything in near Earth orbit, you know, could detect satellites. In fact, we see Earth satellites all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and of course, we see the sun, but it's not not very sensitive to very distant astronomical objects. But you know, we think it could be very useful in detecting aircraft because it doesn't transmit anything, so it's totally passive. Mm-hmm. Now, does the uh, does do these elements all have to be co-located, or could they be scattered around a, a wide area? Or even a continent? Well, in principle, they could be scattered around, but it makes the data processing much more complicated. And so it's much easier if they are co-located. Uh, on the roof of the building where we are now, we could expand to, I calculated once, 256 elements. And uh, that would really be good. And then if we could replicate that same size one at different locations around the state or the country, mm-hmm. that would be really great. Now, it doesn't sound like it's a very expensive system to build. You need but small elements and, and computers. Is that pretty much how it works? Yes, it is. The uh, <clears throat> elements are made on printed circuit boards, about oh, maybe a foot and a half or two feet across. So they could be easily mass produced. And then we use off the shelf hardware for the preamplifiers and the computing equipment. For the bigger telescope, we would need much more powerful computing equipment. But that all exists today. Mm-hmm. So it certainly be possible. Yeah. Uh, so could you give us a rough idea of how much it would cost to, say, build the, the full-size one equivalent to the big ear? Or? Well, I, I don't really have any estimates of that. You know, I think somewhere maybe in the million-dollar range oh. or so, I suppose. So. Or, there's a lot of technology development necessary. The biggest expense would probably be hiring the people or mainly graduate students mm-hmm. to do the design work and make it all work and operate. The hardware and software or computing equipment is not going to be that part of that expensive. Right. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, having been involved with SETI for some time now and radio astronomy, uh, how you judge the current state of SETI and, and where you'd like to see it go? Well, you know, I'm kind of sitting on the sidelines now because we don't have anything that's really sufficiently sensitive to detect anything. Whenever somebody announces something, some new discovery of a burster or something, we always look at our data, but we don't see anything because it's, it's too small. I'm very pleased to see the SETI Institute doing all the work that they're doing. They have wonderful um, <clears throat> stuff that they put on Facebook, which is all sorts of interesting articles. And I, I read those faithfully, and it's, it's just really great. And, and they are doing their own work. They have, you know, in the works what they call, you know, the uh, all-sky survey telescope or something like that. But they have never proceeded very far with that. If they had money enough, you know, which they would look to make this actually happen, and they would love to have an omnidirectional radio telescope. Now, of course, people like Paul Horowitz at Harvard are doing optical study, and I think that's wonderful. And uh, I think popularizing this is a, a great thing that the SETI Institute and, and others are doing. Because, you know, we always have the problem that this is kind of like a, oh, you're, this is kind of funny. What are you looking for, little green man? You know, what's this all about? But once people actually hear from scientists who are doing this work and they understand that. Now, you were talking about uh, optical SETI when I, when I lost you. Okay, well, you know, what Paul Harvard, said, uh, Harvard is doing is great. <coughs> he has this telescope that's on purpose and. <clears throat> is doing optical study, and that's a wonderful thing to be doing. And the people at the City Institute are using various telescopes, such as the Arecibo or their own, the Allen Array, to do study. And, and I think this is the way it has to go. We keep on doing this. Would you like right. to? Would you like to see uh, NASA fund any of the study out there? Or you- oh, of course, absolutely. Yeah, it's a certain 
sometimes it's hard <clears throat> to get people to understand that this is a serious scientific effort because they think we're looking for little green men. But the great thing is when they hear people say at the city institute talk, these are very learned, educated people, and they talk in very down-to-earth terms that people can really understand. People like Schiff's the stock <clears throat> and Jill Tarter, you know, they are very convincing people to listen to. Right. Yes, I agree with that. Uh, well, you you haven't been out in the front of the public much. I think have you done interviews uh, for podcasts or radio lately? Or no, I've never done a podcast interview. Oh. As you see in my uh, resume, you know, many years ago I did I've appeared on radio and TV occasionally, but nothing recent. Oh well, good. I'm I'm glad we could uh, we could get you for this interview. Um, the uh, is there anything else you'd like to add about either the Wow Signal or um, Argus or anything, any other related topic? Uh, advice to young scientists, perhaps? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess the advice to young scientists is you're not going to make a living doing this, but then getting into astronomy and now the search for planets is just exploding. And so there's many people working in that area. And people more and more are now beginning to think we can maybe detect actual planets around stars and maybe even moons around planets and detect smaller and smaller planets that are more Earth-like. So, And then, then we have astrophysicists thinking about, well, you know, was there really a Big Bang or how did the universe really start and what's dark matter and what's dark energy? We live in an exciting time in terms of, you know, what science is doing and it's, it's just Really mind-boggling to think about it. Well, um, Bob, I'd like to thank you for your time, and uh, good luck with Argus, and uh, maybe we can help get the word out on that a little bit. And uh, I hope that uh, I'll be hearing about your success with that in the near future. Well, thank you so much, and please let me know you know when people can watch this. Oh yeah, it'll be just a few. It'll probably be about a week or so. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. I'd like to thank Dr. Dixon for appearing on The Wow Signal. He's largely an unsung hero in the SETI world, and I also really hope that Argus can move forward. It strikes me as a highly cost-effective approach, and more important, it partially removes SETI search dimensions by keeping tabs on the whole sky at once. The best locations for an Argus array would be at the north and south poles, or as close as possible, since the same part of the celestial sphere is in view at all times. I mean, come on, a million bucks is a tiny sliver of what it costs to build a new stadium or even repair an overpass. Okay, it will probably cost more than that, maybe three or four million, but that is still chump change by Silicon Valley standards. Someone should be able to come up with the money for at least one full-scale Argus instrument just for the naming rights. However... I want to point out that we need at least two. Now, back to the wow signal event. The wow signal was a single 72-second event detected by the Big Ear, which was sweeping past the constellation Sagittarius on August 15th, 1977. The signal was strong by astronomical standards, and as we will discuss looked just like an ET beacon. What we know about the signal is its frequency, an upper bound on its bandwidth, its timing, and the profile of its signal strength in 10-second intervals. I think the case against the WOW signal as an ET beacon is well known. Now, just because the WOW signal has not been proven to be from a known source doesn't mean it's from ET it's at least remotely possible that the wow signal was some sort of strange problem with the big ears receiver that only occurred once or that it was an extraordinarily elaborate and strenuous inside hoax, although those explanations have been all but ruled out. Or 
it could have been something we haven't thought of. Remember the recent story of the faster-than-light neutrinos? The experimenters were baffled, but finally it turned out to be a subtle error in timing and the anomaly went away. What we need, then, is independent confirmation of the wow signal, and we haven't got that. Since the wow signal was discovered after the fact, when Jerry Emmon went through a stack of printouts, it was far too late to get another radio telescope to break off what it was doing, swing over, and confirm the signal. The signal was never confirmed, and no similar signal has been found in that exact region of space. This is why the wow signal can't be cited as definitive evidence that we are not alone. As Bob Dixon just told us, there are multiple reasons to think that the wow signal may have been an ET beacon. Earlier in this episode, we described a simple model of an ET beacon. Its purpose is to announce ET's existence and possibly the interest in conducting a slow but meaningful conversation. And you want any pretentious primates out there to have the best chance to see it and not confuse it for a natural source. How long you, the extraterrestrial engineer, would be willing to maintain the signal directed at one star would depend on such factors as the rotation rate of your planet, the length of your year, how long your list is, and your strategy for sending such a powerful signal. One such strategy might use gravitational lensing from a massive star, and the time duration for directing the signal to us would necessarily be limited. To make your radio beacon detectable and not mistaken for a natural source, you make it as narrow band as you can and give it as much power as you can afford. Also, you would want it to be at a frequency well known to radio astronomers at which they might be listening. The wow signal meets all the criteria for an ET beacon. It is from deep space. It is not associated with any known natural source. It remains in the same narrow band the entire time. Its wavelength is close to the 21 centimeter hydrogen line and away from any authorized spectrum. And it is a strong signal, well above the noise. Now, associated with the wow signal, you will often see the letters 6EQUJ5. Jerry Emmons' article has a detailed explanation of this, but in a nutshell, each number or letter encodes the observed signal strength for a 10-second integration period. The peak strength, encoded as U, is about 30 times above background. If the source is fixed on the celestial sphere, and it does appear to be, then we would expect the signal intensity to rise and fall as the rotation of the Earth scanned the big air past the source, which is exactly what happened. The thing that impresses me about the wow signal is not its strength, but its narrow band. The entire signal fell within a 10 kilohertz band and may have been narrower. That was simply how the receiver was tuned at the big ear. This was a narrow band microwave signal. During the entire 72 seconds, it stayed in that band. That, combined with the beam width and scan rate of the big ear and the frequency at which it was detected, means that a man-made source is extremely unlikely. All the natural sources of that strength are well cataloged and are not to be found at that location. Furthermore, natural sources are not narrowband, and this is one reason SETI researchers look for narrowband signals since they stand out against the natural background. Almost equally impressive is the wavelength of the signal. It is very nearly on top of the 21 centimeter hydrogen line. The small difference between the observed frequency and the 21 centimeter line is easily explainable as Doppler shift due to relative velocity between the transmitter and Earth. Another key feature of this frequency is that it is not used by satellites to transmit to Earth. The duration and profile of the signal is also important, but that is exactly how long you would expect a signal to rise 
peak and fall off were very far distant from Earth, essentially at a fixed location on the celestial sphere. In this case, the constellation Sagittarius. We can't identify a specific star that the signal came from because of ambiguity in the direction of the source equal to about half a degree. A huge angle in astronomical terms. There is one thing about the wow signal that puzzles me a bit. The big ear actually had two horns, two feet horns about five feet apart, and one leading the other by about three minutes. So we would expect to see the signal rise and fall in the leading horn, then repeat in the trailing horn. This was not observed, which means that the signal either turned off or on between feed horns. We can't tell which feed horn it is since the receiver only recorded the difference between the signals from the two horns. This strikes me as a bit of a coincidence, but not so much as to be impossible. And remember, there is good reason to believe that the duration of the beacon would be short. So, there are three independent lines of evidence that point to the wow signal being an ET beacon. With that going on, you would expect humanity to make it a priority to repeat the detection. This has, by and large, not happened. What do you think we should do? I don't know you, but I like you. So we've finally covered the actual wow signal. We could go into much more technical depth, and I'm willing to do that with anybody who's interested. I hope you now understand at least a bit about it. But if you have any questions or any points you would like to dispute or improvements we can make, please stand up and be heard. We'd also like to hear from you what future guests we should have on and what topics we should cover. You can go to the blog at wowsignalpodcast.com and comment there. Or you can go to our subreddit, Wow Signal Podcast, our Facebook page, or our Google Plus community. You can also email us at wowsignalpodcast at gmail.com. We're keen to get a lively discussion going about all the topics we cover. Also, Please follow us on Twitter at Podcast Wow for the latest news and information about the podcast. The companion blog to this podcast is Dream of the Open Channel. Go to disownsky.blogspot.com to read that blog. And if you are well informed about such topics as SETI or SETA, and you think you might want to join me as a co blogger there, I'd like to hear from you. Now, if you liked what you heard in this episode, there is plenty more coming in the future. The WOW signal doesn't just cover SETI, but everything about humanity and nature through the lens of understanding the place of intelligence in the cosmos. Coming up soon, we'll discuss the asteroid risk to planet Earth and what can be done about it. To make sure you don't miss an episode, you should subscribe. Whatever software you listen to podcasts on should make this easy for you. But if you don't, but if you do have any problems, please shoot us an email at wowsignalpodcast at gmail.com and we'll figure out what's wrong. As always, this Creative Commons podcast is free and subscribing won't cost you a penny. Also coming up soon, we hope to have a listener roundtable similar to our Douglas Adams roundtable that we had back earlier this year. But this will be a roundtable of listeners discussing the major topics we cover. Um, If you want to talk about Douglas Adams, too, that's fine. Um, That will probably be in late December. If you are interested, 
send me an email or go over to our Google Plus community on Google Plus and and um, there's a poll there and that's where the event will be announced. This podcast would benefit from financial support. If after going to SETI.org and dropping some coin in the SETI Institute, you have a few bucks left, you can go to patreon.com slash wow signal and help us out on a per episode basis. The more we get, the better and more frequently we can produce the podcast. I'd like to thank our guest, Bob Dixon, our musicians, DJ Spooky, Erica Lloyd, Chanticleer, and George Robb, and our announcer, Aaron Carr. And of course, thank you for listening to Season 2, Episode 7 of The Wow Signal, the podcast from the future. Oh, and here's yet another song by George Robb. Lights out. I don't know what it was, but it was. I expected the worst when we heard about it first. Fifteen.
tell you never know you never know you never know you never can tell you never know you never know you never know you never can tell you never know you never know you never know you never can tell you never know you never know you never know you never can tell you never know you never know you never know you never can tell you never know you never know you never know you never can tell you never know you never know you never know you never can tell you never know you never know you never know you never can tell you never know you never know you never know you never can tell you never know We live in an exciting time in terms of, you know, what science is doing. And it's just really mind-boggling to think about it.